Could we see some pretty significant changes amongst a couple of Canada's teams in the Calgary Flames and the Toronto Maple Leafs? We'll discuss what we might happen in the offseason coming up next. So welcome back to another video here at Top Shelf Hockey. Now, as I mentioned, I want to take a look at some trade talk from around the NHL from a couple of Canada's teams here in the Flames and the Leafs. Now, keep in mind, I'm not suggesting these two teams are making a big trade together, and I'm not suggesting that these guys are trading these players just for the sake of making trades. Now, there are two teams in completely different situations. From the Flames' perspective, we're looking at the fact that they have not had the success that they're looking for during a regular season or the playoffs, and maybe it's time to shake up that core. The, the core seems to be struggling. Guys like Monaghan and Gaudreau could probably benefit from a change of scenery and really change what the Flames' makeup is. Now, from the Leafs' perspective, it's strictly from a salary cap perspective. Now, the Leafs are having another really solid regular season, and they hope to have a solid playoff season, which we'll know by the time we get to the offseason when these things could happen and how everything went. But for right now, uh, they're in very different spots. So let's dive in first with the Flames situation. Now, really, the Calgary Flames have had a disappointing regular season. They changed the head coach in Daryl Sutter, uh, and things haven't really improved. I mean, the other night when they lost to the Ottawa Senators, they had an opportunity to make ground in Montreal to have a chance to grab that last playoff spot at least. And the team, to me, just didn't look like it had the energy. Like, I just don't know where the desperation is. Where is that will and that desire to win? I, I just don't see it. I mean, there just seems to be something missing in Calgary. And I think some significant changes are likely in order here once we hit the summertime. Now, I think there was some talk about even some shakeup at the deadline. These types of big trades, though, tend to be more common for the offseason. Uh, obviously, teams tend to have more flexibility with the salary cap. Uh, they have a lot of players in expiring contracts. It's just, you know, a lot easier to get done. But a lot of times we see the groundwork laid at the deadline and all the discussions leading up to it that then help execute deals once the season is over and we get closer to the hectic part of the offseason with the draft and free agency in that busy time of year when we see a lot of trade activity. Now, the Calgary Flames have two players in Johnny Gaudreau and Sean Monaghan that seem to be uh, regressing a bit. In the case of Monaghan, you could say he's been regressing really, unfortunately, for a couple of years. And under uh, head coach Daryl Sutter, he's really struggled hardcore. And you look at all his stats and the underlying numbers, and they are simply not good. Now, Johnny Gaudreau's stats are a little bit better, but they're still not fantastic. Even to a degree, look at a guy like Matthew Kachuk, who's uh, on a shorter-term contract, going to be an RFA again soon. And uh, $7 million bucks. I don't think they're getting enough out of Matthew Kachuk either. I mean, at one point, Matthew Kachuk was one of the most difficult players to play against. He got under your skin. He drove you nuts. Uh, you know, and I'm not sure where that guy went. I mean, I understand he had a few situations. I think that the team might have asked him to tone things down a little bit but he's not the same player that he once was i'm not sure what exactly is going on if that's more of a, a flames organizational thing where they wanted him to change his style or something but he he's not that pest type of player at, at the present time like i mean at one point he was in a conversation with guys like brad marchand and uh, you know, others that were the most difficult guys to play against, the guys that drove you the most nuts, some of the most hated guys in the league. And, like, to me, he just doesn't seem like that same guy now. So, uh, Calgary, I think, is really due for a shakeup. Now, they're in a situation as well that they're in a not-so-good spot when it comes to the expansion draft for the Seattle Kraken coming up. They're bound to lose a pretty decent player. Uh, I've speculated myself that they could expose Captain Mark Giordano. He's got one more year left. I mean, Giordano's still... Producing at a decent rate, you could say, for his age. Um, but, you know, at the end of the day, maybe a change at the captaincy and the leadership might be what this team needs as well. I mean, he's only got one more year left. Uh, how much longer is he going to continue to play? It's hard to say. I know he's a guy that's been relatively healthy, keeps himself in pretty good shape. So I would say it's pretty good to guess here that he's going to want to continue playing beyond the current contract. But should the Flames go in a different direction? I mean, I'm not really sure that that's 100% something they're going to do, but it's certainly something they need to ask themselves and certainly consider. Uh, but if it's not a defenseman like Giordano on the blue line that they lose, it could be a more significant forward like a Michael Backlund, for example. If they go 7-3-1 that most teams are going to use for protecting players, uh, Michael Backlund very well could be a guy that gets exposed uh, in an attempt to keep some younger players like Dylan Dubé 
in Andrew Mangiapane. I mean, uh, one of those three players is going to be exposed and likely be the target that they Seattle takes if it's not Giordano. So, uh, you know, will Brad True Living be one of those GMs that tries to cut a side deal with Ron Francis in Seattle so they take a specific player? It's difficult to say. I don't know. But either way here, they signed themselves uh, an all-star goaltender in Jacob Markstrom. Uh, they have some decent young pieces there. But, you know, this team needs change. Uh, we've talked about before about Johnny Gaudreau, um, you know, maybe wanting to head back to the eastern part of the U.S. where he's from, uh, whether it be the Flyers, Devils, or somewhere in that part of the U.S. that he would probably prefer to play in. Many people feel that that's inevitable. Uh, I can't say with any certainty that it is or it isn't. I mean, we've heard Johnny Gaudreau say all the same right things that he likes Calgary and he sees himself playing there for a long time and all those things. But like I've said before, you can't take too many of those things uh, and, and really take it to heart because they say what they they have to say. I mean, they're not going to come out and say, yeah, in a year's time, I'm probably going to leave. I really don't like it here that much. And I'd rather go back and play for the Flyers if I could. And like, they're not going to do that. You just, you're never going to see that happen. When a player's under contract, he's typically always going to say that he likes it there. He's happy and he hopes he can stay. You never would hear anything different. I'd be shocked if you did. So you, you got to just, you know, forget all those comments for a moment for all the people saying Johnny's not going anywhere as he said on, on, on uh, the record that he wants to stay okay sure every player ever has always said that so we, we can't take that for granted now uh, but at the same time what does this team really need like it needs something that's hard to play against it needs something that can produce offensively it needs something that has that will and grit and Matthew Kachuk has all those pieces now I've seen an article as well uh, suggesting that even though the Flames likely wouldn't do it that they should at least entertain the idea of trading Matthew Kachuk because he's not producing at the level that his contract is right now and even though he likely could start doing that again that he could get them a really good haul of picks and prospects and players like a good really good solid return to really help the teams move forward now I personally don't know I think Matthew Kachuk really if he can get back to playing to that pesty style that he was before that I haven't really seen much this year I, I think he should be the, the captain of the team I think he could be the guy they build around and really be the, the build the building block not necessarily the guy they they move out now guys like Gaudreau and Monaghan could net them pretty good returns here as well um, I think it's pretty safe to say that at least one or both of these guys will be traded unfortunately though for like a guy like Monaghan his value is dropping, and that's not good for the Calgary Flames. I mean, he's still relatively young, which is good. Uh, he still has a little bit of term on his contract, which is good. But at the same time, like, at one point, this guy was a consistent 30-goal-scoring center iceman. I mean, that's something that I felt he flew under the radar and was a really underrated player in Calgary for a long time. Didn't really get the recognition he deserved. Uh, and sometimes Gaudreau got more of the spotlight, but he was pretty darn good himself, and he's really fallen off here. But if a team really feels they can get him back to being that 30-goal scoring center iceman, that's a that's a pretty good guy to have on your team. Like look to a team like the Minnesota Wilds looking desperately for that top center iceman who want they likely want to make a trade for uh, maybe a guy like Matt Dumba, for example. Could that be something that we see? I mean, that would make sense from just from a positional standpoint. I'm not sure if they're each the exact right player for the franchises, but they're looking to get here. But obviously the Wild are looking to trade Dumba before the expansion draft so that they don't lose him. Um, and they want a center iceman in return. That's what Bill Guerin made it known before. He wasn't going to pull the trigger unless there was a deal he was happy for. So that's a prime example. And then they could afford to lose a guy like Giordano, theoretically, uh, if Dumba comes in. So, you know, that's, that's another situation we could see. But I think it's pretty fair to say the way this Flames team is playing right now, that I'm sure Daryl Sutter and Brad for Living are extremely frustrated with this core group of players. And we're going to likely see either Gaudreau and or Monaghan both be traded this offseason and I said they should they listen to Matthew Kachuk I guess you always have to listen I, I but personally I'd be working with him to get him back to being a player that he's been he's still young enough and good enough that I think he can get back to that myself but Gaudreau Monaghan I just don't know like Monaghan's fallen off and when it comes to Johnny Gaudreau you know a couple of years ago he put up a 99 point regular season but when it gets to the playoffs it just seems to be so hard for him to get the production and really help the team move forward that I think he needs to be a secondary piece there's so many guys that are great hockey players and offensively gifted players skilled players like they're just they're just not good enough though at the playoff time when things get really hard to be the guy they need to be more of a complimentary secondary piece like look at Taylor Hall 
going to Boston. He struggled mightily to be the guy. Phil Kessel, prime example, goes to Toronto in a trade to be the guy. You know, did well. Took a ton of heat and criticism though when the team didn't do well. And ultimately did much better in Pittsburgh where the pressure was off. He was like the fourth or fifth best player. Got himself a couple Stanley Cups. Goudreau could certainly go to another team and possibly do that as well. You know, as far as Monaghan, obviously I think a change of scenery that would be more likely to get him going again. Some guys just don't work with the same system. And, you know, maybe it's time for these two players to move on from the franchise. Daryl Sutter's not going anywhere for a while. He signed a three-year contract, including this year. So we've got two more years. Um, you know, and I would say that Brad True Living is likely going to have to make some trades to save his job this offseason. So let me know what your thoughts are. Are the Flames going to really attack this core and move some of their longtime core guys like Monaghan and Gaudreau this offseason, like many of the rumors suggest? Let me know your thoughts and maybe some mock trades down in the comments and we'll discuss further. Now, on to the Maple Leafs. Now, as I mentioned, this video is not suggesting that the Leafs desperately need to make big trades just for the sake of shaking things up. They're in a completely different spot from the Calgary Flames. And if you're looking at the thumbnail of this video and you see faces like Nylander and Riley, they're not necessarily players that are rumored to be traded. This is my, the reason I, I selected them was because in my opinion, regardless of how this season goes for Toronto, regardless of how the playoffs go, they could win a Stanley Cup. They could lose in the first round or anywhere in between. They will need to make a significant trade of a contract out this offseason here, in my opinion. And I'm going to show you why. And I think guys like Riley or Nylander, the more reasonable contracts, would be more tradable, have more value, and would be more likely to be the guys to go to free up that space that they desperately need. So if you take a look at Cat Friendly, which is I've got all my data from here, and I'm going to give you some slides on the screen to show you each kind of part of the team, uh, they don't have a lot of space for next year. They've only got 15 players under contract for next year, and they only have around $11 million in cap space. So if you're going to carry at least a 20-man roster, ideally 21 or 22, maybe upwards of 23, of course, like that's still that's not a lot of money per player, and you have some interesting names that either have to be re-signed or replaced, and if you get one or two guys in there with some decent contracts, you know, how are you going to fill up the rest of your roster? Now, they've done well with a group of players that are playing on either ELCs or um, league minimum contracts. But, you know, they have to bring back a lot of guys in that same boat. And even then, it's going to be a challenge. So let's take a look at where their cap situation is. And I'll explain my logic here a little bit further. Because, I mean, the, the main the main thing that I've been hearing about the Leafs is how they're going to handle their offseason and what kind of moves they're going to make. But it's not necessarily linked to Riley or Nylander. But let's dive into this a little further so I can explain why I think they could be on the move. First up, let's look at the forward group right now. Let's take a look at what's under contract here for next year. You've got Austin Matthews at 11.64. you got Marner at 10.9. John Tavares at 11. Nylander at 6.9. Alex Kerfoot, who's been subject to a lot of trade rumors himself, at 3.5. you got Ilya Mikheyev at 1.65. Pierre Engvall at 1.25. Nick Robertson still on his ELC at 821,000. And Adam Brooks coming in at 725,000. Now that's based on today's active roster. Of course, there's no guarantee that Robertson or Brooks would be on that roster. I think everybody else would probably have a regular spot from the opening day of the next NHL regular season. Uh, good chance Robertson could as well, to be honest. Brooks, maybe. Hard to say, but that's just based on what the active roster here is today. Now, pending unrestricted free agents include veterans Jason Spezza, Jumbo Joe Thornton, Wayne Simmons, Alex Galchenyuk, Zach Hyman, which is going to be the complicated one here, and of course, uh, newly acquired Nick Foligno, who's widely expected to be there just as a rental because I don't see any way around how they can afford to keep him beyond the uh, the playoff push here just for the, the one season. Now, that gives them $48.4 million tied up in their forward group next year. And of course, with what you have uh, on the sidelines here in the UFA column to either uh, pay up and sign again or to replace that gives you nine players under contract for the forward group you're going to need at least three more to fill out your roster ideally you want a 13th and if you can uh, to have an extra guy on the active roster so you're going to all probably want about four of those guys to return we know felino is likely not going to be it so far we have reason to think that guys like galchenyuk will want to stay because he's actually been the better fit there than he's been in any team he's been around for the last couple of years uh, obviously we know zach hyman wants to be a leaf and we'll discuss his contract momentarily and of course right now uh spezza thornton and simmons it's reasonable to think that maybe they could all return 
for a, a, another one-year veteran cheap contract. It's no guarantee, but it's possible. So I guess a lot of that's probably going to depend too on how this playoff run goes and if they were winning a Stanley Cup or not. That could ultimately change their minds on if they a, want to keep playing, do they want to keep playing in Toronto, or how's it going to go for the remainder of their career. Personally, I think a guy like Jason Spezza will stay with the Leafs until he's retired. Hard to say when it comes to Simmons or Thornton, no. I mentioned out of all those contracts that are UFAs, Hyman's definitely the most interesting out of the bunch. I think it's fair to say his contract's going to end up anywhere from probably 4.5 to $6 million. I know it's a big range, but somewhere in there is likely where the number is going to land. Now, recently on TSN Insider Trading, Pierre Lebrun was discussing the situation. He polled several other executives from around the NHL to ask where they thought Hyman's contract would end up. Now, they, he was given this wide range of anywhere from four and a half to $6 million. $6 million's on the high end. Probably not going to be that high, but some felt that they might use the Brendan Gallagher contract in Montreal as a potential comparable. It might get him closer to that, but a lot of it's going to depend on whether or not he stays in Toronto or hits the open market. I think if he stays in Toronto, many feel he's going to sign somewhere between four and a half and $5 million. However, many people feel that if he were to hit the open market in free agency, that teams could be lining up to pay him even more. Considering where contracts are at in the pandemic and the revenues are down and all that, I'm going to say probably at a max of 5.5. So that 4.5 to 5.5 range is kind of the sweet spot for Hyman. So if you only have 15 players under contract, so if you need at least four forwards signed for next year and you give Hyman, let's say, close to 5 million bucks, and you need three others at close to a million or less, that's still that, that now you're looking at somewhere between seven and eight million dollars for the remainder of your forward group and we haven't even talked yet the blue line or between the pipes for the goaltenders now let's take a look at their back end and what's under contract here we've got morgan riley under contract at five million dollars you've got jake muzzin at 5.625 tj brody's making five million per year justin hall is making two million and then i get you got rasmus sandine at 894 still on his elc that leaves Zach Bogosian as a UFA, and you get Travis Dermott as an RFA. Now, between the pipes, you've got Jack Campbell making 1.65, and you've got Freddie Anderson and David Riddick as UFAs. Now, of course, the contract for Campbell is only good for one more year, and if he continues playing well, he very well could be the starter next year. And to be honest, he might have to be the starter next year. They may not have any choice in the matter. Now, whether or not they re-sign Zach Bogosian or they bring in a comparable for him, they're looking at probably a million dollar range for that contract. Travis Dermott very well, you know, could get himself a small raise, but he's likely not in line for a huge payday here either. And that leaves the goaltending situation that if Campbell does return as the starter, then you have a hole there. Do you bring back Freddie Anderson? I don't think you have the money to. Do you bring back David Riddick? Well, we don't even know if they want to. And if they do, uh, it would be him or a comparable likely for a million dollars or less as the backup role to Jack Campbell would be my assumption on how things are going to go. But really, to have any kind of cap flexibility, don't you see this in the nature here that a big contract really needs to go out the door? I mean, they, they're going to have already as of right now, uh, like I said, $11 million available. They only have 15 players under contract. If Zach Hyman is going to get paid and they want it to bring in a, a, another goaltender to work with Campbell, even if it's not Freddie Anderson, say another 4 to $5 million range, they would be completely screwed. They would not be able to do that. At this rate, they're really going to have to choose. They either are going to have no choice but to go with Jack Campbell as the the goalie and another cheaper goaltender as the backup next year at which point maybe they can get away without moving a guy like Riley or a Nylander for example as I mentioned here earlier but you know what at this point they have so much money tied up with the cap not rising that's really a major issue and I think that we're going to see something more significant out of Toronto this year now if they happen to not have playoff success and they go out early, then it's going to just increase the more likelihood on who's going to go, I guess. But at the end of the day here, the Maple Leafs have got themselves in a cap situation that's going to force themselves to trade a good player in the very near future, and they're not going to have much choice. Now, of course, the Leafs, like everybody else, are going to lose a player to the Seattle Kraken. It's difficult to say exactly who that's going to be uh, with the uh, forwards the way they are and the number of UFAs they have. They're likely going to be able to protect their assets pretty well there. Um, some think that maybe they'll even go eight skaters instead of seven, three, one and do four forwards as the top four guys, obviously Matthews, Marner, Nylander, and Tavares, and then protect 4D so that they don't lose a guy 
like Justin Hall. Because to me, Justin Hall would be the main target if they go 7-3-1. Because if they only can protect three defensemen, you know that's going to be Brody, Muzzin, and Riley. But at the end of the day, the goaltending issues that the Leafs are running into recently, if they want to go out and get themselves a decent you know, mid-range goaltender that's going to make anywhere from like 4 to $6 million, then a bigger name has to go out to make that happen. There's absolutely no choice in the matter, or they're going to have several of the smaller contracts go out where it's a guy like Kerfoot that would have to go, a guy like Hall would have to go, uh, and then they have to run with a guy like Campbell and a cheaper alternative behind him as the backup goalie. He wouldn't really have any choice in the matter. But I honestly think this is going to be the offseason when we see something more significant to give themselves a little bit of cap flexibility. They've been playing cap gymnastics here with the LTIR uh, exemptions for quite some time for the last couple of years. The cap's not going up anytime soon for another probably two or three years. They might as well make the plunge and get a deal done here to set themselves up to have a little bit of breathing room over the next few years as they continue to be one of the top teams in their division and continue to contend for a potential Stanley Cup. So let me know what moves you think are most realistic for Toronto this offseason. Who's more likely to get traded out to create that cap flexibility or to adjust the goaltending situation? Let me know your thoughts in the comments and we'll discuss further. If you're new to the channel, consider subscribing and turning on your notifications so you don't miss any future content and give this video a thumbs up if you enjoyed it. I'd appreciate it if you did. As always, thank you for watching and I'll catch you next time.